I think the judge actually needs no introduction. Um, as we all know, Judge Gallarza has had a very distinguished career, both in private practice and most recently uh, on the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, where he recently took senior status. We are very honored and very privileged that he has consented to join the school as our first ever distinguished jurors in residence. And I suppose if there's one thing I want to thank the US Congress for is giving us the America Invents Act to coincide with your arrival at the school so as to give us this opportunity, very unique, I believe, to hear directly from you with your experience as to your thoughts on some of the more significant changes wrought by the Act. Today, as you know, the judge will be speaking on the first to file patent system, and on Friday, we will be discussing the post-grant proceedings changes. So without further ado, Judge, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Wong. Good afternoon, or good evening. After a full day in class, I can feel for you regarding how you want to spend the next hour or so in uh, learning about the America Invents Act, especially when you're trying to get ready for finals, too. So uh, we'll get on with it. And maybe you, uh, when you take your finals, you might get tested on the AIA. I don't know if the professors will be testing on that issue, but it's called the American Invents Act, or the Lay Smith Act, or the Full Employment Act. If you read the bill, you'll find that it's full employment for lawyers, because we'll be at, at it for the next 20, 25 years trying to figure out what the Congress has done. The act itself was passed on September 16th, 2011. That's when it was signed into law by the president. And the date is very, very critical because some parts of the act became effective on September 16th, 2011. The section we're going to be talking about tonight the first to file section, which is section three, takes effect 18 months after that. So the effective date of the first to file act is March 16th, 2013. During that time period, the old law still applies. So the first to file for patent applications does not take effect until March 16, 2013. It means that during that time period, we will have two patent acts in effect, both at the patent office and also in the enforcement of patents which are filed before that date. So just think about that, a dual patent system which is going to be in effect. What does that bring us? Brings us to the point of somewhat uh, convoluted aspects of the patent law. But did the AIA really change the patent law? Well, it did. However, the standards of novelty and non-obviousness are still the same in relation to the prior art. The enablement written description requirements are still the same. Patent eligible subject matter, still the same. We're still trying to figure out what section 101 of the old act means. Supreme Court just issued an opinion, I don't know if you've already read it, Prometheus, in which they reversed the Federal Circuit, 9-0. They kept their record intact. They reversed the Federal Circuit today by a 9-0 opinion in Carrico. However, as a comment to that one, I dissented on the denial of the in banc on that particular case because I thought my colleagues were wrong. 
and the Supreme Court vindicated me by following my dissent. So once in a while, we do win. The other aspect of uh, subject matter, beyond subject matter, is claim interpretation remains the same. Remedies for infringement and direct and indirect infringement, namely active inducement and contributory infringement, are still the same. The patentability challenges that arise are the same. So what do they change in the first to file? And why do they change it? The Congress, in the act itself, contains two sense of Congress resolutions. The first one, Section 3.0, recites a sense of Congress on providing inventors with greater certainty regarding the scope of protection provided by the grant of exclusive rights to their discoveries. They wanted to make sure that inventors step up to the bar and disclose their invention and file for a patent. And second, Section 3P recites a second sense of Congress on harmonization. The patent system virtually every other country except the United States, including all nations belonging to the European Patent Convention, have a first to file priority principle and an absolute novelty provision. We were the only country that had the first to invent process with all of its attendant uh, ramifications. Abandoning the first to invent priority principle does bring the United States in closer international harmonization. However, one of the problems that the new act still carries over is a pre-filing grace period by the inventor in the inventor's disclosure. So there is a grace period which is granted to the inventor for one year prior to his filing or her filing for the invention. This is really not in harmony with what we have in other parts of the world. We have now a first to file, but with the grace period, it is not in harmonization with the European system where there is no grace period. So that's one of the big aspects of the first to file. One of the other aspects which comes in under the new law is section 102 and the events that delineate what constitutes prior art for applying the obviousness condition of patentability. The AIA retains a concept described in printed publications. There's a new section under section 102 which adds otherwise available to the public. Think about that phrase for a minute. Otherwise available to the public. That phrase, if you think through the language, I think is gonna create more problems of interpretation than any other section of the act. As a matter of fact, one of the items which was discussed on the floor of the Senate during ratification of the act, of the bill, by a number of senators. What do they focus on? What would you think? That new language. That new language is going to create more problems for the courts than any others. If in fact we need legislative history to interpret that language, just think about that. Supreme Court justices, some of whom despise legislative history, they don't like it because they know how it's made. Some judges at the circuit courts 
do not like legislative history. And I tend to follow the concept that legislative history is good to interpret statutes which are unclear. However, if the statute is clear, you never go to legislative history. There are some cases in our court, in my court, that state specifically that legislative history can be looked at to obtain a sense of Congress even though the statute is clear. That to me is totally wrong. The statutory language should be the controlling factor in any interpretation of the statute. So let me go back for a minute, and I need to read this because it's rather extensive in many respects. But the Senate considered the final House bill, H.R. 1249. Senator Kyle reiterated the understanding of the phrase, quote, or otherwise available to the public. He stated, and I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's rather lengthy. Once an invention has entered the public domain by any means, it can no longer be withdrawn by anyone. The word otherwise makes clear that the preceding items are things that are the same quality or nature. As a result, the preceding events and things are limited to those that make the invention available to the public. Does that mean that any disclosure which is available to the public anywhere in the world, because now the act and the new statute has eliminated the restriction of prior art being limited to the United States available for patentability. So anywhere in the world, public disclosure. Moreover, not to be undone, Senators Leahy, who was one of the sponsors of the act, and Senator Hatch, who was a ranking member, Republican member of the Judiciary Committee, got into the act, and they brought in a new statement. Prior art will be measured, they both said, from the filing date of the application, and will typically include all art that publicly exists prior to the filing date, other than disclosures by the inventor within one year of filing. Prior art also will no longer have any geographic limitations. Thus in section 102, the in this country limitation is applied to public use and on sale is removed and the phrase available to the public is added to clarify the broad scope of relevant prior art as well as to emphasize the fact that it must be publicly accessible. I'm just pointing this out that basically when you use language which I think is rather elastic in statutes, you're always creating interpretive problems. Language as described in section 102, and this is new section 102 as I said, in printed publication or in public use, on sale or otherwise available to the public before the effective filing date of the claimed invention. Now, when we reach that point where we have that kind of language, we have a number of cases and decisions from the Federal Circuit which state that the availability of information also depends on its particular location and whether a person of ordinary skill in the art would obtain that information and understand that information to be prior art. Are all those cases gone? Does that mean that we have eliminated by one particular phrase, all of those prior art limitations? I don't know. This is why I'm saying this could be full employment act for lawyers and judges for years to come. Where does that bring us? When you have a particular aspect 
of the amendment. The more significant than the retained concepts and the concepts under section 102 that the new section 102 omits. So they've included some from the old section. They've omitted a number of others. Old section 102A referred to known or used by others. In a long line of court cases that interpreted the phrase as meaning knowledge or use that was at least minimally accessible to the public. The phrase diminished in significance as the courts expanded the definition of what constituted a description in a printed publication. Now they retained printed for publication in the new act, but the new section omits known or used phrases in particular. It retains from section 102B the phrase in public use and on sale and then adds that phrase that I mentioned before, otherwise available to the public. The old sections 102A and 102B qualify the non-documentary events known, used in public use and on sale by the requirement that they be available and within the United States. Now the other aspect of attempting to determine what is public and on sale, what happens if in fact the inventor sells his invention to a third party? Would you think that that would prevent him or her from filing for a patent application if it's done outside of that one year time period? certainly would. However, what happens if he sells to a third party and that third party takes the invention and proceeds to file a patent application based upon that invention? It's done within the year of the public disclosure of the public sale. Does that mean that the non-inventor would obtain the patent? I don't think so. Not under the new act. You have what is known as a derivative action. So the derivative action takes the place of interferences. Under the old law that was prevalent in interferences, why would that be? Because under the old law, it was not the first to file as we have now, but the first to invent. So you had conception by the inventor and reduction of practice. You had not only to conceive the invention, but also reduce it to practice. And if you were the first to conceive, if you expressed due diligence before you reduced it to practice, someone who was able to reduce it uh, to conceive it after you, but reduce it to practice before you, would still be the junior inventor, provided you could establish the fact that you did have the first to conceive and you had due diligence during the time period from the original conception to the reduction of practice. So you would still win, and you'd still be able to get a patent. Under the new system, we have deriv derivative practice instead of interferences. Did we just change the name to protect the innocent? 
see some people shaking their heads. No? What do you think? Uh, I think that uh, derivative um, action is not an interference because you're, you're not necessarily interested in first to invent, you're interested in whether the later inventor derived from the earlier inventor. So it's a first inventor to file system. So if you have a first inventor who files second and a second inventor who does not derive from the first inventor who files earlier, the second inventor actually wins if he did not derive from the first inventor. So if the first inventor has a disclosure, and the second inventor does not know about the disclosure and conceives completely on her own. The second inventor, because they file first without any understanding from the first inventor or derived from the first inventor, would still be able to file and obtain the patent. Right? As long as the first inventor had not published such that it, his, his invention disclosure was available to the public. Well, if, even if he had published, but the second inventor did not know about the publication, does that protect the first inventor? Is that a priority right of the first inventor at that point? That I'd have to look at the act. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's a question that really is not resolved. Uh, even all of the historical legislative history, there are 7,600 pages plus of legislative history for the act and its predecessor. The particular aspect, I think, that's going to come up is that the derivative function of the disclosure is going to be where it's going to be litigated the most, especially for establishing the right to file for that particular patent application. Now, let me pose a question. What happens if on March 17, 2013, St. Patty's Day, A person from Ireland files a patent application on a widget, a greed widget, in the United States. A person from Silicon Valley files for a blue widget, but the same basic invention on April 17, 2011. Who gets the patent? Is it going to depend on the hour of the filing? Is it going to depend on the date of the filing? Will the patent office be required at that point to issue two patents on the same invention? Think about that. We'll be busy as lawyers for the next 20 years because there are going to be patents which will still interfere with one another. So the litigation practice of interference in district court is still maintained under the Act. Even though we have derivative practice, and the derivative practice is before the patent office. It's not in court. Now, derivative practice requires, and I have to read the functions of the practice proceedings. The AIA requires that the inventor who claims to be the first to invent 
and disclose it. The change under the statute, even though under the old interference practice, 291 is kept, Let me first find it. Uh, the derivative proceedings are threefold. An applicant must file a petition before the PTO to institute a proceeding. The petition must meet several requirements. First, it must set forth with particularity the basis for finding that an inventor named in an earlier application derived the claimed invention from an inventor named in the petitioner's application and filed without authorization the earlier application claiming such invention. Second, the petition must be filed within a year of the first publication of a claim to an invention that is the same or substantially the same as the earlier application's claim to the invention. Now, there is some similarity to interferences because this is similar to the one-year rule for interferences in current in Section 135B. And third, the petition must be, quote, supported by substantial evidence. That's language directly from the Act itself. And the PTO determines whether to institute a, der der a derivative proceeding and as with the interferences, that determination is final and non-appealable. So you essentially have a situation where the patent office itself makes that determination. And then further, the patent office will need to adopt regulations setting forth standards for the conduct of der derivative proceedings including requiring parties to provide sufficient evidence to prove and rebut a claim of derivation. Now, derivation, I think, is a very simple term in and of itself. If you derive the invention that you have filed on in the patent office from the work and the inventiveness of someone else, if you derived your invention which you claim in the application from somebody else's work. Now, what does that mean? What kind of evidence would be required to establish substantial evidence so that you convince the Patent Office to establish a derivative proceeding? And if you don't establish your derivative proceedings with the Patent Office, are you completely barred from ever obtaining a patent? Because the actions of the Patent Office in making that determination are not appealable. So what happens? In the proceedings, if in fact the Patent Office submits it and accepts the derivative application, it goes before the Board of Appeals in the Patent Office, which is now, instead of just one person or two people, it's always three administrative law judges and determines the derivation question. Now, the derivation question sounds vaguely familiar. If you've had any interference understanding, 
derivation question is what? Very similar to what used to be called the count in interference. The count in interference was the issue of the question of what the invention was that was overlapping between the two applications or the, between the patent and the application, which created the interference. The patent office would establish the count, and the count was the invention, the common invention between the two parties. Now we have what? Derivation question. And that is similar to the count. And the question then becomes whether an inventor named in the earlier application derived the claim invention from an inventor named in the petitioner's application and without authorization the early application claiming such invention was filed. Interference? Different issue, but it's still a proceeding before the patent office which determines inventorship. It's not based upon conception or reduction of practice, which were the two factors that had to be taken into account before in any patent interference, before the patent office. It's now a question of whether the invention was derived from the previous publication or any disclosure which was made by the first inventor in which no application was filed. That's going to be fun for a lot of people to ta tackle those problems because at the same time that you're acting on de derivative applications and derivative proceedings, you also will have interference proceedings in the patent office from applications which were filed before March 16, uh, 2013. So all of the applications up to that point are still subject to interference proceedings. All of the applications filed after then are subject to derivative proceedings. Boy, a lot of work. Probably the number of applicants coming to uh, University of New Hampshire Law School will increase twofold because you'll need to have attorneys doing derivative proceedings and interference proceedings. But just think about that because interference proceedings will still be available between two patents which were issued by the Patent Office under Section 291, which are proceedings before the district courts in interference. Now, the question that I have is if you have applications which were issued before the filing date, and they were filed before the filing date, are subject to the old proceedings. Now, if in fact the 291 proceedings are still available and the example that I gave you before about the two widgets and both patents issuing by the patent office, what happens at that point? Both patents are issued, 291 proceedings take place, inventor A sues inventor B saying you stole my invention. Are the applications of law at that point only the concepts of interference that is the concept of first to invent or the concepts under the 291 proceedings be interference uh, derivative proceedings rather than interference proceedings the law is not clear on that point I have to tell you one thing, that uh, David Kapos and I were in a panel together last Thursday, and I suggested that maybe what we need to do is to file 
a technical amendment to the AIA. And I was told that there is a movement afoot in Congress to do exactly that. As I mentioned the last time, I hope we're not reaching the point in patent law, which is similar to tax law, where in essence, every time they amend the law, they always have to file a technical amendment to correct the amended law. So let's see what happens. But he also used a very good example, which I have to attribute to him under the copyright provisions. He said the first to file versus the first to invent is like two parking spaces side by side. The first to invent says you can use this parking space provided you file for your invention and you were the first to invent it, the first to conceive it, you can pull in and use the parking space. But if you were not the first to invent, namely the first conception, first reduction to practice, and the file for your patent application accordingly, you can use the space, but you can be thrown out. And the first to invent process, the parking space is available to you if you have filed with the patent office and you've disclosed your invention and you've got your patent. Once the patent is issued, you can keep your parking space. However, you still have a one-year period, just like the interference proceedings, where someone can come in and say that you derive the application, you derive the invention from what I have published. Is it one and the same parking space? He said, no, they're different. I argued with him and I said, they're the same, just different words, because interference and derivative proceedings are going to be the same. I think they will end up being the same. In many respects, the procedures will be the same and the result will be the same, except for the fact that what you have is a conception process instead of a filing process. I don't know what it is in Europe in that regard, but once you file in Europe, there's no grace period to establish a prior priority right to that invention within that 12-month period. So we'll see what happens. Now, we also have an additional aspect of the petition and the third and last item I think that really needs to be discussed under the section three is the disclosure by the inventor. What does that mean? Section 102B1B, which is a new section, excludes from prior art disclosures of subject matter by persons other than the inventor within a year of the filing date if the subject matter has already been publicly disclosed by the inventor or a joint inventor or another who obtained the subject matter disclosed directly or indirectly from the inventor or a joint inventor. The section 102B1 provision also presents interpretation and application questions. One question which is going to be asked very, very closely and very much in, at every time that it comes up, what is a public disclosure? Is it the same as public available to the public under section 102A1? And the question really becomes how public is public? Previously and publicly disclosed that same exact disclosure, or is it enough that the inventor previously completely disclosed the later claimed invention? How much does he have to disclose? 
Is that going to be a question for the Patent Office in derivative proceedings? I think so. The regulations that will be coming about have already attempted to establish what otherwise would be a public disclosure and the person at the Patent Office who's in charge of those regulations, who's been publishing and making sure that those regulations are quickly sent to the public for comment, has indicated that the largest amount of litigation before the Patent Office will be on the issue of public disclosures. How much is public disclosure and how much is the inventor actually disclosed? What happens in a situation where the inventor keeps it as a trade secret? Is a trade secret public disclosure? Now, we also have had cases in the past, if you recall, under the old law, sales, public sales. There's a sale which is made by the inventor, a public disclosure, certainly is under the old law, and I'm sure it is under the new law, but where does it uh, end and what is actually a sale? If you remember in FAF, the Supreme Court established the guidelines and we took those guidelines and we added a sale under the UCC provisions is a public sale. Will all of those cases transfer over as far as a sale is concerned to the new law? I think so, because they make sense to do it that way. But the litigation aspects of what is going to be available and what is public and non-public is going to be the area that's going to be litigated the most. Because any time that you use any type of sliding scale language without any particular definition, good lawyers will challenge those con concepts and bring them forward. I, I think overall, the net effect of the new section is probably better than the old law in the sense that it makes it a little bit clearer as to what is available for the inventor. And it probably requires inventors to get into the system to file for patent applications quicker than they would otherwise. Because any time that they do not file and someone else files first, even though they were the first to conceive, the protections that were available before under the old law are no longer available. So I think it forces people to make disclosures earlier and to file for patent applications earlier. And essentially, what the system does provide is one in which patents are issued but there is a contract between the public and the inventor. That's the whole process of the system, where the inventor is granted a limited time to exclude others from using her invention, while at the same time disclosing it so others can see what the invention is, possibly work around it, and build on it. That's the whole rationale for the patent system. And I think under the new system, you'll see more patent applications filed earlier. Now the question that comes up also is, what happens to the little inventor, the individual inventor? We can see where the larger corporate entities will be able to file quickly and provide for protection for themselves. But what happens to the little inventor? Is this going to be a detriment to them? Is it a detriment for the universities? The universities lobbied against 
first to file. Their claim was that basically they would not be able to put all their applications together within that time period. And that they would also be at a disadvantage because of the costs involved. Well, there are exceptions. And under the statute, as you probably have read, there is a distinction for micro entities, which includes universities where they get 75% discounts to the filing fees and other fees charged by the patent office. Small businesses would get 50% discounts, while the larger businesses who qualify pay the full rate. Is this a fair approach to the system for the smaller inventor and the first to file? The Congress thought so. So the universities, although they were complaining about it because they cannot meet some of the fees and fee structure and the time periods, are beginning to realize that under the law, they do have an advantage. And the advantage that the universities do have, I think just like any other inventor, if they disclose it and you are the inventor, you get the 12 month grace period. You almost have priority rights under that grace period, which you would not otherwise have. So if you do it and you do it properly within that time period, I think even the universities will realize that the new system can be worked with and can be worked with very well. Now, Instead of my going on, the only other parts of Section 3 that uh, are covered are the Bayh-Dole Act, which was pretty well interpreted by the Supreme Court recently in the Stanford case. Uh, there's some sections on design patents and the international grace period for patents which are filed overseas and the grace period applies to them so that the actual filing date can be brought into par with everybody else. Questions? I had a question about something you said earlier. Um, we were going through an example and you suggested that, so if I'm inventor one and I just make a public disclosure like I publish in a scientific journal and you're inventor two and six months later you file and you claim that you came up with that invention independently. You think even though there's a public disclosure that you had nothing to do with, it's possible that you'll be able to get that patent? You might not be able to because that first disclosure might end up being Well, that's what, how I, under, that's what I understood. And you suggested maybe there's ambiguity there. The, there is ambiguity. Okay. There is a that's, that's much what ambiguity because the first inventor can claim that he had or she had a grace period to file. That's what I thought. That's how I understood the right. law. That's why I was interested in hearing you saying that there was ambiguity. There is ambiguity because the second inventor is going to bring in a derivative action too and see if he can establish that he did not derive it from you and if he was the first to file, he could upset the apple cart. That's interesting. I thought if, if you had that prior art out there and that was would block somebody else from claiming it, it might not. That's okay. Thank you. Normally it would, but it might not. It depends on how long your pockets are in litigating that issue before the patent office. It always depends on that, too. I have a question. Um, you mentioned that the financially it would be an advantage for universities since they'd be having 75% off the filing fee. Now, I know a lot of tech transfer offices, they go through uh, quite a large amount of disclosures, and sometimes it's not the money that, that's the problem, but more like their own bureaucratic uh, hindrance that causes them to disclose that early and, uh, earlier. It seems like, you know, just financially it helps universities, but still procedurally it's still a bit of a hindrance to them for uh, first to file. But whose procedure? The university's procedure? I would say so, yeah. 
they should get their act together and get it out quicker. <laughs> that, that was my reaction too because I worked with another university, my alma mater, and they complained about the fact that universities would be at a disadvantage because of bureaucracy which is involved. But the bureaucracy of the university is well within their control. They can certainly get their act together and uh, get those applications in quicker. But I think universities also have an advantage because of the publications. Would that, would that be a problem with the uh, international policy of absolute power? Not necessarily. For the U.S.? I would assume some technology coming out of the university would be the preferred to file it internationally. Um, and some international law says that they, you know, once it's known anywhere in the world, it's, it's barred from, from being protected. Well, as I understand it, some of the uh, earlier dates uh, of filing in the United States would be given same filing process in overseas filings, too. I think the European protection would be the same, wouldn't it? Um, you would still have to file before your publication due to absolute novelty. In so, uh, some of the foreign countries. Yes. Right. yes. But you, you have to do that under the current right. system, so there's, there's really no change. There's no change to that. plan on filing, you know, broadly, internationally, you, there's, there's really no change. But, but I think the new system, once it's in place completely, will be a streamlined system that will make it easier for people to file for patent applications. And force them to file earlier, too. As many times what uh, we have found in some of the earlier filings in the interference process, people specifically withheld filing and then claim due diligence from the uh, reduction of practice, from the conception to reduction of practice, so that they could extend their time period of the effective protection which they would have in that particular invention. The system was being gamed quite well in that particular area. I think it's still probably going to be gamed. People will find ways around it. Uh, it's not a perfect system, but I think it's an improvement over what we had. As I said, it's going to keep lawyers and courts busy for many years to come. In a derivation proceeding, is a, a actual knowledge or maybe just constructive knowledge by the second inventor, would that be sufficient to show that they derived from the first inventor? That's why the question is going to be tried before the courts. Uh, before the Patent Office. The aspects of what derivation means is going to be wide open. Constructive knowledge could be used as a uh, possible aspect of it, that you knew about it but didn't know about it directly, but maybe you should have known about it because it was a publication across your desk and you didn't know about it. My thought on this whole, the act is that I think it's just people have to unlearn some bad habits. I mean, the, the publication in the U.S., the grace period is only here. If you have clients that have any thought of filing abroad, the first thing they should do is file. I mean, it, it, it's just, it, and if you're going to publish a paper, why not file that as a provisional application? You pro, it'll, it'll get you a filing date, it'll put you in the driver's seat, You've got to file a CIP of that, in essence, um, and you get your foot in the door. I think it's just, and it's not very expensive to do that. I think it's just part of unlearning some bad habits. It's putting us um, back what most of the foreigners think about. You file first, then you then you start selling, disclosing, and so forth. But you're right. From a practice standpoint, it's really getting rid of some bad habits we had before that we relied on for protection purposes. I mean, I've always told people, uh, you know, the U.S., that's fine for the U.S. if you have any thinking of foreign. So forget about the, the grace period for the most part. You file first and then um, then disclose 
and that <coughs> keeps you safe. If you have a problem, then we look into where you might have been compromised. Well, that, that's the way most lawyers would advise their clients, saying, in essence, if you're going to file internationally, you need to file as quickly as possible. And nobody knows up front, you know, whether well, they're going to file internationally, whether it's going right. to be important, and so forth. So, good practice, file first. Well, the uh, SIR applications have gone out the window under the new act, too. You know, the uh, temporary uh, disclosure type of, uh, because it didn't mean anything, you just register it. But uh, the pre the application filing, the pre-application filing now should take the place of all of that. What's your view? I mean, I've seen, the, I've seen every provisional applications. I've seen things from four figures to, you know, full-blown uh, utility applications. The statute says that you have to have an enabling disclosure. Um, but I've seen the realm of, you know, of uh, disclosures. And, and I know it's going to be an issue uh, what you file, but obviously the better the disclosure, the better you're going to be. But with uh, the act getting your, you know, trying to get your foot in the door first, would you advise your thought, would you advise just file something first, maybe file two or three provisionals as you're going along on an important case. First disclosure, file it, three or four weeks later, file another one, and as you sort of develop the thing, you've got bits of disclosure and get three or four priority claims. The question I always had about provisional applications is whether it needed to be enabled. And I think it does. So you'd still have to disclose the enablement aspects of the uh, application of the invention. But you're right. Uh, you could file one, two, or three uh, preliminary applications and uh, just get get in the door. And it, to me, the applications which you file at that point are not going to be very extensive anyway. But you get your filing date, which is critical, I think, under the new system. I just make sure, oh, you said derivative actions before the USPTO is non-appealable? The derivative action before the PTO is appealable. Whether or not you, when you file for a derivative application with the PTO and they deny it, that's not appealable. Do you think the rush to file will keep inventors from thinking through whether or not they're better served through uh, state trade secret laws? Just rush to the patent. You can uh, protect by a trade secret, but uh, you're taking a, an awfully big chance, uh, I think, in trying to protect it by a trade secret. Coca-Cola has obviously been able to do that for over 100 years, but that's a very unique position. Because trade secrets eventually get disclosed. So in order to protect yourself, and I think under the new system, uh, I would advise a client to file for a patent application. You know, beyond the scope of today's topic, uh, how about the change in prior user rights, sort of as a follow-up? Prior user rights. Is that under a trade secret protection or otherwise? Well, some might say that the expansion <laughs> of the prior user rights in the, in the American Defense Act might, might weigh in favor of trade secret protection and, and make it more viable. And I'm not saying that I'm one of those. I'm I wonder if that's the case. With the, the aspects of uh, trade secrets, as a matter of fact, was part of the discussion legislative discussion. Uh, Congressman uh, Lundgren from California was talking about it as he said he was on the floor of the House with his iPad and getting messages from one of the tech companies saying that uh, because of the prior user rights, trade secrets are probably better. And I think that that's probably not the, the approach that I would take or advising a client. Trade secrets have always been 
something that uh, people have said is probably better than uh, patent protection because you can maintain it for more than 17 years or more than 20 years. But I wonder if you can really keep a trade secret that long without it eventually coming out of the bag. And if you try to enforce a trade secret, you're doing it under state law anyway. And uh, state law, I think, uh, in most cases is strong, but would you want to try a trade secret case in Nebraska, for instance, or North Dakota? So you have to be very careful about the venue that you choose for that. I'm curious about the, the time to resolution and the financial resources necessary for uh, uh, derivative actions. I think derivative actions can probably be quicker than uh, the interferences. Uh, the procedures which are now coming up before the boards are uh, going to be much more open. Uh, you'll be able to make oral arguments before the boards. You'll also be able to uh, get quicker service out of the patent office. Uh, the uh, director has indicated he's already hired another 100 uh, ALJs, and he eventually would like to hire 200 more, bring the full force up to 400. If he does that, I think the procedures of derivative a, uh, process in the PTO will be much quicker than interferences. Uh, interferences can take forever. There's one interference that I know that took 32 years before it was finally resolved. And the patent issued after that. So polypropylene case took that long to resolve. And by the time you get uh, four or five parties and in interferences, uh, it took a while. The, uh, in, in that particular case, the junior party and most junior party won, which would not be the case, I don't believe, in derivative proceedings. I think most derivative proceedings will probably be two-party actions for the most part, which should make it quicker. The Patent Office right now is beginning to work its backlog down on their applications. They're also cutting back on the time periods waiting for uh, appeals to the boards. So hopefully with the new people coming on board, they'll be able to cut that even more. Question about uh, the revision proceeding. It sounds like that only the, the same or substantially the same terms between first invent invention and the first file invention. I'm wondering, is it possible to evoke a derivation proceeding between uh, obvious obviousness type variations, obvious type uh, claims? I mean that these two claims are just Obvious is obvious to each other. Just that obvious is that well, instead of being derived from the other, yeah. it's obvious one on the other. Yeah. That's an interesting question. Uh, is obviousness a derivative? Yeah. Uh, it's probably the kind of an issue that uh, if you take it that the initial disclosure did not file, but the second one, which was filed, was obvious, then there's no invention because it's obvious. So the first one would be the one, the proper party to be able to get, obtain an invention. If, in fact, the second filing was obvious over the first one, the first one would become prior art to the second one, even a derivative action, I would think. If the first one is not published, if the first invention is not published, how can it be there? Oh, if it's not public? Yeah. 
and the second one files? Yeah, the second one files first. And if it's not, if it's not a public document, then he's out of luck. Yeah. Or she's out of luck. It would seem to me that if, unless you publish, there can be no derivative process from it. You'd have to have a publication of the invention. Someone else could derive from that publication the second and, and if the second application is obvious over the first and the first one was published, the first one would be prior art against the second one. Because the first inventor would still be able to file. And if you establish derivative actions at that point, then I think the first one would be available because he would still have the grace period over the second one. Uh, this is more of a patent prosecution question, but um, there's a practice of swearing behind a prior art reference that will often happen during a response to an office action. Are you familiar with that? Or Swearing it on, I'm swear familiar with it, the yes. <coughs> I'm just wondering, I mean, with the first... I swear around all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, do you know if swearing behind, it sounds like in a first-to-file system, that would disappear because you're saying, and when you swear behind a reference, you're saying, even though this reference was filed before okay. I filed my patent, you know, I invented before this reference was, was filed. So is this swearing behind going to disappear? Or it's probably going to disappear completely because you don't need to anymore. That's what I thought. But I haven't prosecuted a patent application since the early 60s. <laughs> <laughs> Filing fee was $30 at the time. <laughs> and I quit after the first five. Uh, just kind of a tangential question to uh, Ian's question earlier. I thought you were not, uh, you can't swear behind an actual U.S. application or U.S. patent. It's something that you cannot swear behind, but you can swear behind uh, like a publication. A reference. A reference. But I don't think swearing behind is going to be a practical aspect of the patent prosecution anymore after the first the file goes into effect. Well, but keep it in mind until March 17, 2013. Any more questions? Thank you.